Hello and welcome to today's KDP Universities at Home with Alessandra Torre. I'm Trisha, and for, for the past five years, I've moved around Amazon's books teams, learning the business so I can share it with authors. Prior to coming to Amazon, I worked as a graphic artist, project manager, and educator. But we're here to talk to Alessandra Torre. Alessandra is a New York Times bestselling author who has hit bestseller the bestseller list over a dozen times with all with self-published books she writes romance and suspense novels with unexpected plots and unforgettable characters president of authors ai a company that uses artificial intelligence to help editing and improving novels so when she's not geeking out over technology and fiction alessandra enjoys playing with her dogs and herding chickens in her Key West backyard. Welcome, Alessandra. There hey you guys. go. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's always exciting to be able to talk to you. I'm so excited to be here. I've been waiting for this day. So thank you. Um, thank you for having me on. Definitely. Well, we always love to start off with a little bit of background information. So let's find out how you got started as a writer. I started writing in 2012, so I was 28. I had I was not someone who had ever planned to be a writer. It was um, I was a reader. I loved to read. I had enjoyed writing in school, but I was never encouraged or never got high marks in writing. So I had no confidence in my writing. But um, I was 28. I was in between jobs. I was trying to figure out just like what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and I had this summer ahead of me. And my mom started to write a book and she was telling me all about self-publishing, which I knew nothing about. Um, and it was just this opening of a door that I didn't know existed. It was like, oh, so I could write my own book and put it online and um, and people could buy it. Like that was just such a foreign idea for me. I had always thought that writers had to be in New York and had to have connections and had to go to school for writing. Um, so. I didn't tell her, I didn't tell anyone. Just that summer I thought, you know, I think I'll just try to write a book and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And I wrote Blindfolded Innocence, which is my first book. It was a romance. I never expected to write a romance. I never read romance. That was it, but that was what came out. And um, and I just read it over a few times. It sounded good and I published it. Um, and that was back in early days. I say early days of self-publishing, but um, mm -hmm. it was like the wild, wild west back then. It was it was a different world than it is now. And nowadays, you really need a polished product, um, and you really the the more effort you put in pre-release, the better mm -hmm. of a chance of success. But back then, the market wasn't very crowded, and um, and my book just it took time, but it ended up taking off and. That was really when it was like, man, like I had reviews coming in. I thought, maybe, maybe I'm good at this. Maybe I could keep doing this. So I, you know, crunched the numbers and I thought if I wrote five books or 10 books, I wouldn't need to go back to work. And then um, this could be my job. And then um, almost overnight, my book just went crazy. And it was like, and I made more in a day than I had made in a month, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and I made more in a month than I had made in a year. So um, at that point it was really like, oh, okay, like this is, my life has suddenly changed. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was eight years ago. So here I am now. So how long did it take? I know this, uh, the times are different, right? To your point, the mm -hmm. market's a little more saturated right now, but how long, you said it took a while to take off and then it just kind of went gangbusters. So how long is it took a while? A year, six um, months? Three, no, it took um, three months. So I started okay. off like three to five sales a day, um, mm -hmm. sometimes two, sometimes seven, you know, um, but three to five sales a day for the first month and a half. And I slowly worked up to like 30 sales a day, um, mm -hmm. mainly um, right at the end. I had gotten enough sales to hit like the new release top 100 list um, mm -hmm. for, for my genre or subgenre. So that gave me some additional exposure. And um, so I was really at like 30, 40 sales a day, about 90 days in. And um, one afternoon we were packing, we were going to leave town um, for the weekend. And I, I was looking at, you know, 
when you're a new author and many of you listening, you refresh your sales like a crazy person. I mean, you're just <laughs> continually checking to see how many sales you have. Or you have. So I checked my sales and I was looking at my page and I was like, you know, I think I'll, I'll rewrite the book description. Um, so I just jotted down a new book description in Notepad, you know, and uploaded it. And it wasn't much different. I mean, it, it was different, but it wasn't much different. But I wrote a new, what we call blurb, a book description, mm -hmm. posted it, and then we got in the car and we left. And um, I checked sales again when we got to the hotel, and I had sold like 120 copies. And I was like, what? Like, what has happened? You know, like something must be wrong. Like, there's a glitch in the system. I don't know. And um, when I woke up the next morning, I had sold like 300 copies overnight. And every day from that point forward, my sales doubled um, until I was selling like 2,000 copies a day. And it was all because I changed my book description. Like that, I, I made no other change, not pricing, not distribution, not advertising. All I did was I changed my book description. But what it told me was, gosh, so many people were clicking on my cover uh -huh. and then looking at the description and being like, eh, you know, this, I'll just look at a different book. And mm -hmm. that was the missing piece. So you never know what your missing piece might be. Um, mm -hmm. And so even to this day now, if a book isn't doing great, first thing I do, it's cheap, it's free. I write a new book description, put it up, and you can immediately tell either your sales are going to go down, they're going to go up, or they're going to stay the same. So mm -hmm. it's a really um, it's a really nice and easy way to change things up. So what do you look for when you change the book description? Is there anything in particular that you try to incorporate or modify? So, um, so a lot of times I'll change. So different things you can try if you have a, a very short book description, you can try a longer one. So some you know, sometimes book descriptions are just like eight or nine lines, you know, um, sometimes right. they're more. Sometimes we give away too much in our book description. Sometimes we need more mystery. Um, mm -hmm. There are book descriptions that are written from third person or first person. I try to write the book description in the same point of view that the story is. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes people write his, you know, a thing about him and then a thing about her when we're in, when we're in romance. Right. Um, but for me, a lot of times I just take a different angle. If the first book description is really focused on the fact that they're enemies to lovers, then mm -hmm. on the second book description, maybe I focus more on her and her backstory. So to try to appeal to a different audience or hit a different note. So if you, mm -hmm. I think for me, my first book, um, the cover was super sexual. Nowadays, it would never fly. I mean, we, you know, <laughs> the minute it hit the store, it, it would be rejected. But um, back then, you know, we were still figuring things out. So the cover was super sexual and my blurb, my description was not. So I, I made um, changes that really focused more on the sexual aspects of the story and that's what did it. Then my cover, you want your cover to match your um, description. And mm -hmm. if they don't match, then one of them is broken. Um, so mm -hmm. you need to figure out which one. Let's talk about the covers because you're, you're very big on branding and you've done it well. So let's talk a little mm -hmm. bit about your theory with branding and cover design. Absolutely. So um, covers, it, in my opinion, can be the number one um, thing that can move your needle either way. Um, and I haven't been afraid. Uh, the thing is, we often get really attached to our covers, um, but it's a business decision. And sometimes a cover that you absolutely love doesn't work for the book. So that's just the way it is. So I do change covers um, when they don't work, but I do have a few examples to show you. Um, so for me, my brand, I have very colorful covers. Um, and the big thing that's important to me is that the title is legible from thumbnail size. So this mm -hmm. is an example of Moonshot. This is actually, we did a custom shoot. Um, we shot her and I ordered this jersey with the number and the character's name. Um, we shot her in a studio and then we photoshopped, um, you know, the stadium behind her. But um, mm -hmm. I have consistent name branding. So when you see a book, you can see I always have my name at the bottom unless it just does not work with the design. And um, this book I did do differently. It's still the same font, but that was the only occasionally I'll let my cover designer if she really pushes 
this cover was just too busy when I had my big name. Um, but for the most part, 90% of my books follow this same name branding. And one of my very first author conferences I ever attended, and if you have a chance to attend an author conference, they're one of the best places to pick up things. Um, I sat in a panel and um, I believe it was Lillian Hart. She said, put your name big so people think you're important, you know? And it's true, if you look at Stephen King's book, they're not hiding Stephen King like at the bottom, right? It's like Stephen King, and then it might have like the book title in small words. So, um, so a long time ago, back when I got home from that book conference, I said, okay, I'm gonna make my name as big as I can. Um, and this is something, if you are a new author and you're picking a pen name, um, it's something to consider because Alessandra is a really long name and Tori is a short name. And um, so you have to make, you have to think about the spacing of your name on the cover. It seems like a crazy thing to think about, but if you have initials, that kind of makes it hard because then you're basically kind of have to put everything on one line, which is fine. But if you have initials and then a really long last name, it can cause graphic design problems. Um, but the other thing with your covers, you just want to make sure it, meet, it fits your genre. So you want when somebody looks at your cover that they immediately can be like, oh, this is a sports romance. This isn't super obvious. This is actually a romantic suspense. So um, I use darker colors. Um, it's not it could pass for general fiction. But when you look at, for example, tripping on a halo. Um, sorry, I just hit the mic. Um, this is a romantic comedy. So I wanted it to be fun and playful. This could also pass as a chiclet cover. Um, but honestly, this book could pass. A, a chiclet reader would also enjoy this book. So I'm fine with it um, being confusing. Mm -hmm. But again, I wanted to make sure um, that you could read. This isn't my best example, but that the cover was big enough to be legible, that it wasn't lost in the background, has my normal name branding. And then with all my covers, I try to do again bright, colorful covers um, so mm -hmm. um, to appeal to the reader. So those are those are a few examples. Um, Thank you for sharing those. I think anything? that was, no, I think that was great information. I think that that's one of the questions. And then the next question is, you know, how do you find a cover designer or do you design your own? Um, so I've, I've been through a lot of cover designers. There are a few things I'm really loyal about, um, but cover designers are not one of them. Um, so normally for me, my process is I mock up my idea of a cover using like PicMonkey or Canva or any free thing. Or sometimes I just draw it on a piece of paper. But I, mm -hmm. I mock up my idea of what a cover is if I have one. Um, and then I send it to a designer. So. Where you can find a designer, what I would suggest is um, is create like a Pinterest board or a folder of all of your favorite covers, like covers that really appeal to you and fit what you think your book's branding should be. So mm -hmm. create, you know, ideally find 10 or 15 covers that convey what you want your book cover to achieve. And then look at who designed those covers. And normally you can find that online. You can just search the ghostwriter cover reveal if you search on facebook the title of the book and cover reveal or use the um kindle look inside and they should put the cover designer on um like right by the copyright page like in those first few pages they should put the cover designer there so um and then reach out to them and say hey i love the cover you did on xyz what do you charge? What's your waiting list? Cover designers book up. So a lot of times you they might be two or three months out. So you want to reach out to your cover designer as soon as possible and get on their calendar. And um, and then the budgets completely vary because with I've had covers that I've spent a thousand dollars on. I've done custom shoots and you know, and then cover design. I've had covers that I used a three dollar stock image, or we combined three or four stock images. Um, but if you're gonna invest in anything, it's editing and cover design. Um, th those are the two things that I would suggest. And it was funny, we did a panel at um, Inker's Con, a conference that I hold. We did a panel um, with bestsellers and I said, if you can only afford one, do you do cover design or editing? And oh my gosh, it was the most heated conversation. And there's no good answer. That's the thing. Like right. even we were all waffling back and forth because it was like, well, no one's gonna read it if it has a crappy cover. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so it was it was always like, oh, like learn graphic design, design your own cover, and then <laughs> and then paper editing. <laughs> so 
but it's, I think it, that that's extremely important. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's a great call out because, you know, the cover is going to bring people in, but if you have the good editing, it's going to hold their attention. But, you know, so it, it's it's really, that's a tough call. It's tough. It really boiled down to what are, where are you confident and what are your strengths? If you are a fantastic writer and you can come up with a polished, a pretty polished, great story, because um, there are some, my first book, I had no editor, I had no proofreader, it was riddled with errors, but I, ha I had a raw talent, right? Like I knew how to tell a story just from reading my butt off. Um, so it, people forgave it because it was a story that they really enjoyed. Um, so if you have a good enough story, then you could invest in the cover and then as soon as you get that first money coming in, you know, hire, hire an editor and clean it up, um, clean it best you can. But if if you're a horrific writer, then then you need to spend the money on the editing because the reviews right. are going to kill you even if people buy it or they're going to return it. Right, right. Good call out. So you've mentioned conferences a couple of times. Um, one of the things you went into, you wrote, and then one of the things I've noticed is that you gave back. You turned around and started educational components for other authors to share that journey that you and the what you learned along the way. Can you tell us a little bit about that pivot? Yeah, so when I started out in 2012, it, like we said, it was a different market. And part of what made it a different market was we didn't have all the resources that we have now. Um, so now you can go on Facebook and just search psychological writers, right? And there's a Facebook group for it. You can join it and you can ask them all sorts of questions. But when I started, we didn't have that. And if we had it, I wasn't aware of it. Um, so the resources for someone, especially in self-publishing, the first conference I went to was RT Book Reviews. And there was only a handful of self-published authors there. Majority of the authors there were traditionally published. And they turned their nose up at self pub I mean, when, you know, it was a clear divide. Like we were on a table by ourselves. And it was like, you know, um, like no this is turned up and it I mean now nowadays you know um we laugh oftentimes at traditional publish like what we're snobby about it now you know like oh you know you're traditionally published but um but it was a different world so I may I didn't have resources I spent money in ways that I would never spend money now because I didn't know any better um I was hiring traditional book publicists that maybe were nonfiction book publicists, but I didn't know, you know? So I made a lot of mistakes and I wasted so much money and so much effort um, doing things wrong. And it was one of those things, um, even with like writing my first book, I read a bunch of books on craft that just terrified me. I mean, they were daunt daunting and intimidating. And I was like, I really want like a writing for dummies, right? Like I need something that's just, this is how you write a scene. And this is how I describe someone. And this is how two people talk in a conversation in a book. Um, so as soon as it was one of the things that was like, oh, it was on my bucket list. Like as soon as I figure my own stuff out, um, then I want to work with someone or, or I want to create resources that help someone in my position because I love this business and I hate anytime I hear someone didn't make it through their first book or they gave up or they, you know, or they signed with a publisher who's charging them money when they could have self-published. And it's so easy, self-publishing is easy. Writing a book, if you just have the fundamental understanding, it can be easy. It's not, I'm not saying that, I'm not trying to knock the accomplishment of writing a book, but um, right. but if you have the tools, it makes your life so much easier. So that was really, it was like um, four, four years in, I felt like, okay, I feel like I know enough to share it with others. And so that's when I started online courses and free content online. And then um, and then I really exhausted my well of understanding. Um, and that was when it was like, OK, I really need to bring in other people because I know how I outline, but I don't know how someone else outlines. And my way of outlining might work for 15 or 20 percent people, but it isn't going to work for the rest of the author community. Um, and that was really when InkersCon came about. So it was like. I need all of the smartest people I can find. <laughs> and I can't teach about Facebook ads because I don't know anything about Facebook ads. <laughs> so I need someone who can know everything about Facebook ads who can share it. Um, so that was that was really how that came about. And um, and it I love it because it's 
it's different. They're like two different minds, you know. Um, writing is one, but it's a very solitary, you know, activity. Um, so I love the community aspect also, and um, now I'm able to be part of both. So that's great. So if you're talking to a brand new author, somebody who's just getting started, and you are like, okay, here are the five things you absolutely have to know in order to get started in this business. What are they? Oh, pop quiz, five things. Okay, so the first thing you ha absolutely have to know, I'm kind of winging it. I'm sure yeah. I wrote these down in advance. <laughs> we were gonna do this a month ago, but first thing you absolutely have to know is that you do not need anyone's help in publishing your book. Um, do not hire a company to publish your book for you. Um, that is the number one mistake that I see people doing. Do not go to a local print shop or look online to order print copies of your book. They're gonna want you to do a print run or multiple things. You can publish your book for zero dollars. You can have a paperback in hand in your mailbox for less than 10 bucks, just a single copy or 10 copies if you wanna send, you know, pass them out at the holidays. But, um, but do not hire someone to, or pay someone or pay a company to publish your book. Self-publishing is ridiculously easy. Um, even for if you're not tech savvy um, and there are resources online, I'm not trying to tout my own courses, but you don't have to take a course, but there are step-by-step -step courses for how to publish your book or videos, the KDP University. I mean, you can, you can walk through it or you can pay, if you're older, you can pay your next door neighbor's child or something, but yeah, you can self-publish. So first mistake, um, do not be afraid of self-publishing. It's easy, it's free. Um, and you can publish your work yourself and retain all rights. So that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is don't rush to publish. Um, I see this a lot. Um, you're either writing for one of two reasons. You're writing because you enjoy writing and it's fun and you want maybe people to find your book and read it or you're writing a memoir or something like that and you want your kids to read it. And if that's the case, you don't you don't have to invest in your career a lot, right? You don't need to build a platform, you don't need to start a newsletter, and you don't need to invest tons of money in cover design and editing. Okay, but for that, so that's a group of people. They love to write or they have a story they want to tell, and it's a one-time thing. Vast majority of people, though, who self-publish would like to earn income, right, at some point in time, either part-time income or they want to quit their job and write full-time. So for those people, you really need to treat it like a business and you wouldn't just stick a product out without testing it and without making it the best it can be and learning the market. And so for a brand new author, um, I would say don't rush it. You've got plenty of time. Um, the market isn't going anywhere. <laughs> um, it, it rises and falls all the time. So it, readers are still gonna be there. Um, so take your time, do the best job you can um invest as much money as you can afford without stressing out over it um but um but hire an editor if you, do, if you can't afford an editor use beta readers and use free editing tools online or cheap editing tools online but do as good of a job as you can with the interior of your book um, invest as much as you can in the cover and there are great pre-made covers for 50 35 bucks 75 bucks so even if you can't afford a professional designer at least find a professional looking pre-made cover and use that um, and you can just search pre-made covers romance or pre-made covers sci-fi whatever um, so but um, but treat it like a business okay and so in that case learn the market and really work on your product. Um, and then don't, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, you know, publish a book um, and then write another book. And for me, in the beginning, it was like, if I could just make enough to, you know, I don't know, go on vacation this year, like that would be great. Or, you know, I really didn't need to make any money. It was just something cool. And I have a book on my shelf that I wrote. Like, so, um sales will come the more books you have but a lot of times it's a journey right it's a marathon it's not a sprint so and honestly the one thing you don't want is your first book to be this huge blockbuster bestseller that blows everyone away because you know what you don't have any other books to sell these people right like 
And if, and right. if you're like me, when my book blew up, I didn't have a Facebook account. I didn't have a newsletter. I wasn't prepared. I didn't know what I was doing, you know? Um, so I wasn't even on Goodreads. So I was not ready when that happened. Um, so in a perfect world, even though it doesn't seem right, you want like your seventh or eighth book to be your breakout book because then mm -hmm. you've learned, you've gotten better with every single book and you have a library that you can sell them, you know, once they read that book. So, um, so that's, that's another thing. Um, I think that's like three things. Uh, the yeah. fourth thing um, I would have to say um, is dive into our community. Like it's writing, it's it's lonely. We have weird pressures that our family often doesn't understand. We have a lot of questions that we don't know the answers to. So um, join, join Facebook groups online and just watch the daily traffic, watch the post, read the responses. You're going to learn so much just from, from looking at that. And then there are so many great resources online. So mm -hmm. check out YouTube, check out, I mean, just KDP University has so many fantastic resources. Um, so just, just learn. But but you don't have to do it all alone. There, there's right. You have, I don't care what, I live in a small island and we have like four writers groups. So you have a local writers group wherever you live, no matter where it is in the world. Um, and they might not write the same as you, but it's still fun to get together and write on Sunday afternoons in a coffee shop or whatever else, or have somebody to talk books with. Um, because, and go easy on your family because you're diving into a world that they don't understand and they don't know when you're like, you know, uh, I just hit the top 10,000 on Amazon. They don't know if that's great. They don't know if that's horrible. They don't know if they should be celebrating or they should be, you're crying. Like they don't understand. Um, so, so go easy on them because a lot of times your family feels left out or they ask them questions or, um, and so it's, it's different for them. And it's different for them if you become really successful because suddenly you're like a different person and you have a different world that they're not a part of. Um, mm -hmm. And then the last but not least is just, um, Oh, I had something brilliant. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to come back to that because I had a okay. final thing that I was gonna share, and I can't remember what it is. That's okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Um, I really enjoyed that last one where you know you you have to bring your family along for the journey. You have to educate them just like you're educating yourself because they they just they don't know. To your point, so having support groups I think is an amazing call out. Um, all right. Well, while you're thinking, and sometimes they're not supportive. You know, yeah. I mean, I I talk to authors all the time whose spouses don't support, um, and a lot of times it's because they don't understand it and they feel left out. But it, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times they're like, "Oh, this is a waste of money," or "Why are you spending time?" It and the thing is, it's a, you have to look at it as a hobby that actually could earn you money. I mean, you know, versus. I used to ride horses and I mean, talk about pouring money into something that never gives back. <laughs> like, I mean, it brought me joy, but it's never going to uh -huh. make you a dollar. I mean, I don't care if you do it full time. So this is a unique thing where we can have a great time. We can be part of a great community and we might actually earn some money while we do it. So, you know, yeah. It's all about the mindset. That's a really good call out. Um, so I'm, if you're in game, I've got some great questions that are coming in and yeah. I'd love to take a few of these. All right. So Andrea wants to know, how did you create your reader slash follower list? Um, so Andrea, in the very beginning, I was super old school. And if you're a first time author, um, at the beginning, I had like a Google form in the back of my books. Um, and the back of your books is the best place to get qualified leads. Um, but mailing companies, I suggest Mailer Light. that's the one that I use, is free for 1,000 to 2,000 subscribers and they have great sign up forms. So I would sign up for, if you're not already part of an email service, I would sign up for Mailer Light. that's the one that I like, um, and put, put that, start using that sign up link everywhere. So back of the book is the great place, but also, I don't know if you're doing a pre-order or not, but I talk about my books the entire time I'm writing them, right? So it's like a four month, or six months for some of you guys might be a year process where you're writing your book. And that's, um, that's really interesting to, to your friends, to your family, things, people that aren't in the book world, they don't know anything about it. So you could be like, man, today I wrote four chapters in my book. I'm really excited. I'm leading up to the climax. If you want to get notified when it, um, when it releases, please click here. 
and then you just give them your email sign up. And every time you talk about your book, have that sign up form and say, be notified, you know, um, want to get, want me to email you when it's live, click here. And, um, and then, you know, it's you slowly, but surely will collect readers and maybe it's not a lot. It doesn't matter. Like it's your, your, building the foundation that might one day support a career. So um, so you want to start early and you want to use that link often. And then we like to post on social media five times a day about dumb stuff. Sorry. We like to post on social media five times a day about dumb stuff. And very rarely do we ever post on media on social media about our newsletter list. It's like this forgotten thing. I'm as guilty of it as anyone. So um, I put, I try or I tell my students to try to post online like once a week about your newsletter. Um, and when you send out a newsletter or when you send out an email, say, hey, I just sent out my email with updates. Be sure to check your inbox. I have a really funny picture in there I think you're gonna enjoy. And then you can say, if you're not part of my newsletter list, click here. Um, so, or I tease, I'll be like, um, I have deleted scenes um, from XYZ book I'm going out my next newsletter, don't miss it. And I put it there. Or you can say, I just deleted, like when I'm writing, I just deleted 5,000 words today, um, but uh, I will be sending it out in a future newsletter. So, you know, check your inboxes, things like that. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's one of the number one questions we get is how to build that, that list. So those were some really great um, suggestions. Uh, we've got Cambridge wants to know, how do you motivate yourself to keep writing? And do you start writing only when you have a good story idea or do you start writing anyway and then find one? So this is a great question. So first, how do you um, motivate yourself to keep going, right? That was the question, the first part of the question. Sorry, sorry. I think I froze there for a second. I apologize. Um, I think my, my uh, we've got storms coming through here, so it's going a little bit in and out. Uh, so how do you keep motivating, uh, how do you motivate yourself to keep writing? Let's start with okay. that and we'll go into Let's the second. Let's start with that one. Yeah, so one thing that, um, one thing that helps me and one thing that it just took books and books to understand is that I go through, um, a psychological roller coaster when I'm writing the book. And it starts with, I start writing and I'm really excited about this idea and it's gonna be the next great novel and I have never written such a great book in my entire life. And that lasts normally like 10 to 15% in, right? And then I start going, eh, I don't know about this story, right? And then around 30, 40, 50% is when I really hate my book. Um, and if I had been a new author, thank gosh, my first book, I loved the entire time and I thought I was just brilliant while I was writing it. But if it had been my first book, if I got to that 50% and I'm like, this is the most boring book, I hate writing this book, no one's ever gonna read this book, I would have quit, right? And that right. is what happens to majority of authors. They either hit the halfway point and they're, they have convinced themselves that this book is horrible and they're bored and the reader is gonna be bored, or, and this is just as frequent, you get a shiny new idea that seems so much better than the current idea that you're writing and you should abandon this crappy book and you should go write that new book, right? Because it's the great next American novel. So, um, so now I'm just used to it, right? Like I'm like, this is a normal part of the process. I am supposed to dislike the book right now. This is normal. I'm just gonna keep going. I'm gonna trudge through this. And um, and then I'm going to be at the climax before I know it. And then I'm excited and then I'm enjoying the book again. And then I'm almost done and I'm racing towards finish line. So I am now used to that psychological and, and to me it's normal. So mm -hmm. that that's one thing. If you're a newer author or if you're experiencing this suddenly like mid book, um, that's normal. Um, it's also normal for your first draft to be horrible. Um, I know that my first draft isn't good. And so I don't beat myself up about it because you can do anything and everything in rewrites and in edits. So mm -hmm. when I'm going along, I don't judge my book too harshly because it's totally fine if this scene is garbage. And sometimes I'll be in the middle of the scene. I'll just be like, eh, finish later. You know, they need to leave the coffee shop after they have a fight. And then I move to the next scene. So mm -hmm. I motivate myself because I set um, typically a, a feasible, daily word count goal, 
I try to write five days a week out of seven. I give myself two days off. I pick a time frame where I'm not rushed or where I'm not thinking about something else that I have to do next. Um, I like to write real late at night um, from 10 at night until two or three in the morning because social media is quiet, everything's quiet and I'm not having any distractions. Right. Um, but then I just, I just, I just keep going. I keep going despite whether I think the book's bad or not. And if I'm hating a scene, I'll cut it short and I'll move to the next scene. But that's how, um, that's how, that's my process. And that's how I keep going. The second half of her question was what? Um, oh, do you start how do, um, writing? When do I have an idea? In the beginning? Yes. Yep. Yes. So I don't have the luxury because I do write full time. I, I don't have the luxury of waiting around for ideas to come. Um, so what, but what I do is, when I'm writing, I get these great, brilliant ideas, which often aren't that brilliant. It's just my mind trying to distract me from my current story. So whenever that happens, whenever I do get a great idea, if I'm mid-story or not, I give myself like two or three hours to work on that idea, and I'll write a scene. I'll do like a quick, small outline. I'll write a book description, and then I set it aside in my folder, and I have this folder um that's on my computer and i also have scraps of paper and an actual folder and so when i am done with the book then um and i'm like okay it's time for me to write my next book i pull out that folder and i go through all my ideas um and i find the idea that appeals to me the most and now it's been eight years i probably have 30 or 40 ideas that i go through um and um because it takes me four to six months on each book, a lot of times I'll come up with one or two ideas then. Um, so I normally have an idea. If I am just barren, if you don't have a single idea out there, um, then then I I wouldn't start writing without an idea. I would um, okay. I would I would just start generating ideas and just a laundry list until until you get something that speaks to you. Okay. Um, Kathleen wants to know if you can recommend some craft books that you have found helpful in your journey. Yes. Um, so I will tell you, I hate craft books. Um, they they intimidate me till still to this day. Um, they typically are not interesting and intimidate me. That being said, there's some great books that I do love. Um, one is On Writing by Stephen King. It's my mm -hmm. best book I think I've ever read. Um, that's on craft. Uh, Write Naked by Jennifer Probst is a fantastic book. And then Chuck Win Windig, I might be mispronouncing his last name. He has a couple books, super interesting, dumbed down to my level. I, I am self-taught. I still, to this day, um, think of myself as an amateur in terms of um, craft language and that sort of thing. So Chuck Windig, it's like 101 tips or something like that. There's like 100 tips. But he has a whole series and all of his books are interesting and actionable. Um, so he's fantastic also. Those are probably my top three books on craft. Okay. That was a great question. Sorry, I think I think one of us just froze there for a second. I apologize if it's me. Uh, yeah, I didn't hear anything you said if you if you ask another question. Yeah, now I can hear you. Okay, good. Um, all right. So Heather wants to know, uh, sometimes she feels overwhelmed by all the tools that are out there. Um, and it seems like everyone's trying to sell her something. Um, how does she determine what's important to have when she starts out? So if this is your first book, um, I would say simple is best. So you don't need to have Scrivener. You don't need to have a writing program. I wrote my very first book in Notepad. Um, and um, so it's, and some people handwrite. I, I don't because I'm terrified that a fire is going to come through and destroy everything. But, um, but I would say just have a word processor, whether it's online. I don't use online tools like um, Microsoft Docs and stuff like that, but some people do. But just have a word processor um, that you use save your work frequently and email it to yourself frequently because 
computers crash and there's nothing worse. I mean, there's nothing more demoralizing than losing a book that you've written or half of a book you've written. Um, so have a have a word processor, processor that you like. Um, use pen and paper to outline your books or use a, a, a spreadsheet. If you, if you are a newer writer, I would really, I really urge yourself not to, not to invest in too many tools because you don't yet know your process. Some of you are going to be outliners and some of you are going to hate outlining. I, I hated outlining for a really long time. I still am a fairly outliner. Um, so uh, I wouldn't try to add a bunch of tools. I would, uh, I'd write the book as much as you can, um, finish your first draft, and then I would consider some tools to help you improve it if you cannot afford an editor. Even if you can afford an editor, you want to polish it up as much as you can. Grammarly is a great um, is a great tool. Uh, mm -hmm. I know there are cheaper versions. I think Hemingway might or other ones might be cheaper, but I personally like Grammarly. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's not to tout my own thing, but Authors AI has um, has a digital edit um, developmental editor that can look at your book and show it to you in different ways. So um, I I would look at some tools once you've finished your first draft, but you don't need plotting software, you don't need character development software, you don't need something a bulletin board, online bulletin board with whatever. Um, just simple to me is best because you have enough things distracting you um, mm -hmm. as you're trying to write your book. Good, definitely good call outs. You know, there's so many authors who just grab something and start writing. And to your point, it's less distracting and it helps you get that jump start. Um, we have a lot of questions around budget. Are you comfortable kind of talking a little bit about, okay, so let's talk about a budget when you're, okay. <laughs> so let's talk about getting started, you know, Publishing, self-publishing is free. You can do that for free. But to your point, we've got, I think I'm frozen again. I can hear you. Okay, good. Um, so if you're uh, putting together a budget for just getting started, we talked about either pick that cover, or pick that, um, pick the, the editor. What kind of budget are we looking at? And then kind of as you more, get more advanced, what kind of budget should you be expecting? Sure. So in my um, publishing course, I outlined three budgets. So um, my the first budget is bare bones. What's the bare minimum you need? And you can do that for $150, $200. And um, for $150, $200, what, um, I, I would file a copyright. That's a big chunk of it. You don't have to do it, but I would say file a copyright um, on your book. Um, the other thing is a pre-made cover, which you can get anywhere from $30 to $100 um, for a pre-made cover. And then I would invest, um, I would use free beta, beta readers, a lot of free beta readers um, that you can find online and critique partners and things like that. And then I would use a service like Grammarly and Authors AI um, to to polish up and catch as many. Grammarly is going to help you with the proofreading, um, with catching typos, double words, repeated words, things like that. And then a, a service like Authors AI is going to help you more plot, like your plot structure, your pacing, that sort of thing. So clean up your book as best you can. That is my bare bones budget. Um, the uh, the middle budget, which is great if you can invest in it, isn't um, it's anywhere from like around $1,500, I'd say, mm -hmm. $1,000 $1,500. Um, and with that step up, majority of that is editing. Um, so if you can find a, a lot of times you can find an editor that is a developmental editor and kind of copy editor. So she's going to help you or he's going to help you with your plot and your storyline and your character development, but they're also going to help you clean up your language a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So, and then proofreading is typically pretty cheap. You can get, find a proofreader for $150, $200. All of these pricing are dependent on the length of your book. So if you are writing a 50,000 word book versus a 150,000 word book, the longer book's going to cost three times as much for all of these things except for cover. So that that's something. But when I'm talking about a budget of $1,000 to $1,500, I'm talking about um, for someone with like a 60 to 70,000 word book which is okay. a lot, the majority falls in. Um, mm -hmm. And and then you can step it up and spend about $200 on cover design in that budget. 
um, and that's normally hiring a professional cover design and using a stock image um, so or a variety of stock images um, the and the this cover was a stock image and so was this cover and so was this is a traditionally published book cover this was a stock image too so you can do great stuff with stock images there's millions of them out there um, but you just gotta mm -hmm. hunt and spend time um, and then the pro budget which is what I do now um, I spend um, five to six thousand dollars on each book now um, that doesn't include audiobook which an audiobook um, you can easily spend a thousand to six thousand dollars depending on your narrator right. um, but ignoring audiobook um, with that I buy an ISBN because I do expanded distribution with my paperbacks um, oftentimes um, you'll especially if you're in romance you can easily spend a thousand to two thousand or three thousand dollars on a cover image photo just the photo plus cover design um, I don't typically do that I typically try to spend a thousand dollars or less or I'll do a custom shoot for five hundred dollars um, and then uh, and then editing editing is the bulk of that so I have a developmental editor I also have a copy editor um, and then I have three proofreaders um, I format it myself that's the other thing formatting is something you need to budget in um, and but formatting isn't too expensive um, you can get someone to format your book for like 50 bucks 30 bucks um, so you you can afford and you don't and if you're on the the lowest budget you don't need a formatter you can use the tools that KDP has mm -hmm. um, and you can just format it yourself it's not going to be super fancy but it's going to be readable and enjoyable from readers mm -hmm. so um, so on the pro end I spend around five thousand dollars but I I way overdo it on editing um, and uh, and I the bulk of that is editing and cover and it does and those budgets do not include anything for promotion um, so if you create a great product Amazon will show it to people people will click on it and if it has a high conversion rate they'll show it to more people and your book can go viral with you at, without you spending anything if you have a great book that is packaged well it also mm -hmm. can disappear right so um, so if you want to spend money on advertising it you could spend anywhere from hundred dollars to I've spent thirty five thousand dollars on a book release before um, so it's that's just what what fits you in your budget okay I've had books where I didn't spend any on advertising because I didn't have thirty five thousand dollars so yeah so it's all it's all wherever you're at and what your return on investment is I think the, those are good call outs and those are great steps to get started right to be able to figure out that budget for that bare bones and know where to prioritize um, so Brenda wants to know is attending book fairs or selling from a booth book uh, booth at book fairs worth the time and effort no I'll, I'll expand on that a little bit um, <laughs> but no um, so there's different types of book fairs right so there's a local book fair um, and it all depends on what your product is right nonfiction and that this is another thing if you are um, looking and learning about ebook marketing there is a very distinct divide between nonfiction and fiction so if you're enrolling in a marketing course or attending a conference make sure that it fits whichever bucket you're in okay so because um, the strategies and and that's another thing when you're reading an article and it's talking about how to grow your newsletter and blogging nonfiction authors it makes sense for them to blog it makes sense for them to you know maybe speak on local radio stations and things like that or to you know publish in journals and things like that none of that makes any sense if you're a fiction author so it, anything that you're watching or reading r read it make sure that it applies to you because otherwise you're going to waste time and money on efforts that don't apply to you as an author so are there book fairs if you are writing a book on wine does it make sense for you to have a booth at a wine festival maybe so and maybe that would be a fantastic way for you to grow your business and maybe you could you know people attending will start stocking your books in their wine stores and it makes perfect sense but if you are a fiction author typically a booth uh, or book fair you are limited to the people that you interact with at that event um, I am a 
successful romance author. I have tens of thousands of followers. I travel typically four to five times when it's not a situation like we're in now, four to five times a year to book signings, right? And I have a line the entire time. My Where I'm going with this is I do not make any money. Um, I, I don't make enough money to cover my flight or if I'm driving, I don't make enough money to cover my hotel and I am making typically three to four dollars per book. So I might sell a hundred books, which is hugely successful at an event like that. I might sell a hundred books, I might make three to four hundred dollars and it doesn't come close to, to the investment that I spent to get there. Um, so, and most authors at those type of events sell more like five to 10 copies of their book, right? Um, or they give away a lot. But it doesn't mean it's not a great place to go. Bring a stack of books, pass them out for free, um, and just meet people. And it's exciting to talk about your book and things like that. It gives you good practice talking about your book. But it is not worth the time and effort. If you enjoy doing it, um, if it's fun for you, then go for it. But if you're looking at it as a marketing strategy, um, I wouldn't do it. What would you do instead? as a marketing strategy. I see you have piles of books behind you. Are those for giveaways? <laughs> yeah, so I sell, so twice a year I sell signed copies of my book through a form mm -hmm. um, to my readers. So that's, I used to sell them year round on my website. Um, so instead, if you're wanting to get word out about your book, first of all, your local audience is a great place to to sell copies because a lot of people want to support local authors. Um, so you can do things like readings at bookstores um, or readings at your local library, or you can set up a sign at your local bookstore. Um, that's, there's no travel, it, there's no cost involved. They might ask that you bring the books and they sell them on consignment versus them ordering them. That mm -hmm. normally is what happens. Um, but uh, but I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put my effort there. Um, if you're trying to reach fresh new readers, um, reach out to blogs, offer to do interviews, um, offer to be guests on um, or host um, a Facebook Live on their channels and things like that. I'm going to tell I'm going to just to be brutally honest, 95 percent of marketing efforts aren't worth the effort behind them. Um, so I would rather focus my energy on writing more books. Um, that might appeal to different audiences. Um, it's also something I just enjoy doing more. But a lot of authors enjoy the marketing aspect. So if that's the case, but if you're just like wanting to be as strategic as possible and you're tight on time, I would spend my time and effort on improving your craft, writing great books, and then saving your money and using it for advertising, either Amazon AMS ads or Facebook ads for your book. And that is going to be the single best way to sell more books. Um, and and that's just that's just the truth of the matter. <laughs> All right. So we have the hour has kind of flown by. So we have time for one more question. And then I want to give you an opportunity to talk about some of the resources um, that you have available for new authors before we end. So the last question. Sure. Um, do you do research for your books? Um, I, it depends on the book. Yeah, it depends on the book. Um, so there are books that I don't do any research on. Easiest thing if you're a new author, write about something you know, right? So don't make your person a brain surgeon if you are not a brain surgeon, right? Because you're going to waste a lot of time in learning about brain surgery and you're still going to mess it up, right? Um, so with my early books, I gave them jobs that I was familiar with, jobs that I had had. I put them in locations where I had lived. Um, so I didn't have to look up what winter is like in Bismarck, North Dakota, you know, because I've never been to Bismarck, North Dakota. So um, don't make your job harder than it has to be. And research is a black hole that can suck up all of your time and distract you. Um, so I do do research, though. Um, the more I've written 24 books now, I, you know, I can't write every book where the person is a florist or, you know, in banking or whatever. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I have to go outside um, my thing. So, but I normally choose something that 
I know someone who does the job that I know I can call and ask them. I've written books about baseball because my husband was a baseball player, so I can ask him questions about baseball. Um, so I try to make it easy and I do do research if it applies. But one thing about research is you don't want to info dump. So um, you could learn everything there is to know about life you know, in the 1800s in the small town, but then you're also tempted to share everything that you know, you know, so, um, so it's a fine line. Like you, um, I do do research, but I don't drown in it. And um, when I'm writing a book, when I hit something that I don't know, I don't know what that person would have worn or whatever. I just put a place marker. I'll put, um, I use XXX. I just put XXX and I just continue on. And then later, in edits or at the end of the day, um, then I'll do that research and I'll fill in that spot then. So it doesn't distract me from, you know, what I'm doing. Okay. All right. So before we wrap up, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about all the amazing pro things that you have going on. Uh, Cause I know that you've got some really great resources. Sure. So thank you. So um, first, I do teach online courses. So I have a how to publish, how to write and how to market course. I have three courses and I have um, free webinars and free blog posts and videos. All of that is at alessandratoriinc.com. So you can check that out. And if you do want an interactive, if you, if you want to learn from someone other than me, um, Inkers Con is our annual conference. It's, it's in Dallas every year. We're holding it in Dallas this year, um, but it's also online. So you can attend from wherever in the world you are. Um, and that's Inkers Con. And then the only other thing that I mentioned um, a few times today is authors.ai, which is our um, resource in our AI tools for authors. So if you're on a budget, if you can't afford editor, um, just check out authors.ai and meet Marlo. She's our um, artificial intelligence editor. She's really nice and she loves all, all, all fiction novels. If you're nonfiction, I'm not really your girl unless you wanna know how to publish and then um, check, check out my how to publish course. But I don't know a ton about nonfiction. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us today uh, and sharing all this wonderful information. It was a, a wealth of information. And as always, it's always a pleasure to, to interact and to talk to you. I was so glad I had so much fun. I'm sorry I didn't get to all the questions. I was a little long winded on my questions, but um, but hopefully you guys got great information. And if you didn't, uh, absolutely feel free to check out my website. Shoot me an email um, if you have questions that I didn't cover and I'm happy to answer any questions. Wonderful. And as always, thank you for joining us and happy publishing.